Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I can see some people starting to trickle in right now. Uh, this is the next edition of our webinar series focusing on subscription. Uh, we'll be beginning momentarily. I'm just going to let some folks kind of get settled, uh, you know, uh, and trickle in. And once we kind of have some more folks, we'll get going. So sit tight and thanks for being here. More people coming in. Very exciting. Right. If you're joining us just now, just we're waiting for people to filter in and we'll start momentarily. Great, more people joining. Great, I think we can uh, get the ball rolling here and people continue to join. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, this is you know, another exciting edition of the micromobility webinar, uh, the topic of which is why subscription is sweeping micromobility. We'll be talking about why this is uh, such a growingly popular business model uh, for electric scooters, bikes, mopeds, and so on. Uh, and how businesses that are in this space can achieve profitability, mitigate the risks, um, and build a successful business. So uh, your host today is actually going to be Roman Nelsika. Roman, uh, if you don't know already, is a micro-ability pioneer. He was one of the first people in the space uh, to really start talking actively about micro-mobility as a distinct category. Uh, he's, based in the, he's based in Chechia, uh, where he is a mobility consultant, uh, probably one of the most authoritative and knowledgeable people in the space uh, out there. Uh, if you don't know him uh, from Twitter, follow him at Happy Roman. It's a great follow. Uh, Roman is going to be leading this conversation for us today. Uh, and I'll pass the reins to him shortly, uh, and then he'll introduce our astounding panel of subscription experts. We'll move into a Q&A section uh, in which they'll talk, uh, and at the end, we'll leave plenty of time for audience Q&A. So if you have questions, I advise you to please drop those in the Q&A section um, of Zoom as soon as you can, just so we can make sure to get to yours ASAP uh, and we get a chance to answer it. So thanks again for being here. Looking forward to a great conversation. Roman, are you ready? Yep. Great. Let's go. All right. Look, Let's go. Look, look thank you for, for uh, the introduction. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as I said, the subscription, one of the fastest growing segments in micromobility. And we have tonight a wonderful uh, troop of guests. So why don't we start uh, with short introductions? Karianne, maybe let's start with you, please. Uh, so who are you, where are you, what are you building and why? Well, uh, my name is Karianne. I am a designer and the founder of a design agency and eventually founder of a mobility startup. I'm also an uh, activist and uh, urbanism advocate, and I've been sort of working with merging using bikes as a means, a sustainable means of urban transformation for almost ten years now. Wonderful! Wow, that's a that's a that's a wonderful starting uh, point. Uh, well, shall we? Uh, your your partner in in crime, so to say, in subscription only in France is uh, Driss. Uh, would you be so kind and introduce yourself to our audience tonight? Hi, Roman. Uh, I'm excited to be here, everyone. Uh, so I'm Dries. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Moto. Uh, Moto is an e-bike subscription service out of Paris. Uh, we're the leading uh, subscription here in Paris. So we basically provide our users with uh, modern and state-of-the-art e-bikes that we package under a subscription model, which is basically um, that comes with all the, the services that are essential for, for the users of the bikes and maintenance, insurance, uh, and everything is bundled together through software. Um, I, was, I'm, I have experience in, uh, in shared mobility pr prior to this, so I was managing Bird uh, in France for two years. Uh, and I was also one of the first employees uh, at OFO in, in Europe, which was one of the <laughs> early bike sharing companies um, from China. So I got to experience different models in mobility and I'm quite excited to work in, in subscription right now. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to, to your experience from OFO over to, to, to Moto, but before we get there, uh, Bob, 
you coming uh, to our session tonight from a little bit different angle. And I'm so glad to have uh, another designer here in the group. Would you be so kind and again, tell our audience where you're coming from, why are you in the space and what is on your plate? Yes, of course. Thank you for the invite. Great being here. Um, I'm Rob Vroeg, CEO and founder of Vroeg Design. And Vroeg Design is um, outsourced R&D department based in the Netherlands. We do all kinds of R&D related activities for uh, mobility providers. So since we are Dutch, we have a lot of bicycle related clients, e-bikes, cargo bikes, and my team is their R&D team. So they can hire us to do all kinds of R&D related activities from market research to design engineering and production assistance. And we have some clients in the shared and in the um, delivery uh, area industry. And that also makes us an interesting um, a partner for this panel. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. We yeah. had uh, Nate as well uh, from Particle, which is a wonderful partner to the whole industry. But uh, sometimes that is the line drop. But I believe uh, Nate will join us later tonight. So let's let's give him a, a space to to reconnect. And if we might dive right into our business, we all said subscription, one of the fastest growing um, segments of micro mobility. Actually, BCG uh, forecasts uh, subscription growing by 30% over the next few years, all in all, so faster than any other distribution model. Can you, as the players in the space, give your view? How, how is that possible? If you believe that, if that's under uh, estimation or overestimation, or what are your plans into that? So, Karianne, uh, you want to start? Uh, yes, I can start. Um, I represent We, and we are a cargo bike subscription as a service. We offer uh, compact mid tails to families and urban households that would like to use an alternative for the car. So for us, the, um, it's all about the segment that we're addressing because we know from our user needs that one, two of the most important aspects of their um, vehicle choice is that it's custom to their needs and it also has to be available 24-7 because when you have children, you really don't want to go out on the street with a with a child seat and attach that to some bike that you or a vehicle that you not, don't really know where it's. So we're based on um, car ownership and looking at the horrible um, investment owning a car actually is compared to how little it's used and why people still stick to them. Uh, and we try to design a service that provides all of the benefits of the car and then subscription is the natural choice so mm. it's it, it really comes down for us to uh, this um segment really needs something personal as opposed to shared as their main mode of transportation mm. how important is the subscription bit of the design of the whole service like you don't pay up front uh, the full cost, but you really have a chance to be flexible. Is that uh, what your customers appreciate? Absolutely. The, the entry point of buying one of these bikes is around five, 6,000 euros. Uh, and that's quite costly, especially if you don't really know what kind of solution it is for you. So we are taking down the barriers by offering them a low entry point with price wise and then the added value of the continuous service and and sort of almost 100% uptime is something that sort of kicks in after experience this, uh, experiencing the service for a while awesome awesome driss can you can you compare what Karianne described from, from Oslo in a cargo bike segment, so a sub-segment of subscription, basically. You are, if I know your company well, you are in a bit broader segment of, of micro-mobility with the regular e-bikes. Uh, yeah. So how is the situation for you, for Motto, in uh, Paris? 
Yeah, uh, so we're, um, we're focusing on commuting. So basically we are uh, positioning ourselves as a car replacement. Uh, so what we see with our user base today is that uh, on average people use the bike three times a day. So that's the main uh, way of transportation. And about 50% of our user base come from uh, anything but the bike. So they come from the car, they come from the motorcycle, anything fuel powered, or they come from public transportation and they shifting the new, uh, the newcomers, newbies to the, to, uh, to like bike mobility, cycling mobility. So that's very interesting. And I think that's one of the biggest value proposition of, of, of uh, subscription. And that's exactly what Carrie Ann was saying is that it removes any barrier to entry to the market. You don't have any upfront costs. You don't need to spend 3000 euros in our case that's kind of the retail value of the bike if you had to sell the bike. You don't have to uh, worry about maintenance. That is a huge constraint and friction for most cycling users, biking users is, is the anxiety that comes with, uh, with maintenance and the cost that comes with it. So that's all uh, covered with our subscription. And the last point, which is extremely important in a city like Paris, where I think it's one of the highest theft rate when it comes to, uh, to bikes. Uh, when you own an expensive bike, the last thing you want is to see the bike being stolen within the next two or three months after you buy it. And because our subscription covers uh, insurance as well, and also we're able to track the bikes and we know that we recover the bikes as well, that removes absolutely all the friction and all the barriers to access the service. So, and, and I've been in the space for, for quite some time now. I've, I've been observing what's happening in retail, which is also really exciting in shared uh, that has been growing super fast in the past, uh, in the past few years. I think when it comes to adoption rate, uh, subscription is growing at a much, much faster rate than any other type of, of uh, mobility uh, because it's the best of both worlds, basically. It combines the flexibility of sharing with kind of the quality of experience and quality of hardware that you'd find in retail. So, um, mm. so we're very excited about this space. And, and I think Paris is a great place to, uh, to start such a business because today Paris is the biggest micro mobility market in the world when it comes up numbers of electric, light electric vehicles per, per, per inhabitants. Uh, the mayor and the city hall of Paris is working towards uh, having more and more bikes. Uh, just to give you a data point today, um, the model share of, of cycling in Paris is only 3%. So it means of all the trips on a daily basis that, are, that take place in Paris, only 3% are, are done on, on cycling. And the goal of the city hall of Paris is to get to uh, 15% by, uh, by 2030. So the potential to grow is huge. And we think that the best way to address uh, the incoming people is through subscription. Mm. Awesome. Speaking of, of numbers, just to give our guests tonight a little bit overview, well, how big are your fleets, Dries and, and Karianne, for the moment? Sorry, uh, I can start, with, yeah. Um, at the moment, we uh, are at a very uh, not a very big fleet we are around 200 bikes and it's limited um, to uh, asset uh, financing for us because we have been having waiting lists ever since we started so it's like a supply situation and asset uh, funding and yeah but uh, funding. yeah but it's, it's fair to say you you grew up to 200 uh, uh, cargo bikes within uh, less than one year if i if i'm uh, right a little bit over a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah we yeah. also so experimented this... with some other services, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, pure subscription services or yeah, um, wonderful maintenance service. Yeah. Uh, Tris, how big is your fleet in 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 Paris? So we started the service uh, back in May uh, this year. Uh, we've been growing super fast at uh, 35, 40 percent uh, growth month on month. Uh, just like Ariane, we are constrained by supply, our ability to uh, deploy bikes. Uh, we've passed the thousand subscribers uh, in Paris, uh, and we think that we by mid year next year will be at five thousand plus. Oh, awesome! Well, I'm glad to to see in the meantime Nate uh, from Particle, our host as well to tonight. So, collection solved, uh, Nate. Uh, when you observe the scene first, uh, would you be so kind and introduce yourself to and and what Particle brings to the state to the party? Uh, tonight and then of course your view uh, why subscription is the segment to, to focus the energy and and good people around 
Yeah, hey, thanks, Roman, and uh, good to see everyone. Apologies for uh, the connection issues here. Uh, I'm Nate Wang, I'm with Particle. Uh, I focus on our light electric vehicles and micromobility segment here. And uh, really what that means is taking our technology platform, our products and working with our partners uh, on a global capacity to create new business models. And I think, you know, bringing that to the micromobility segment, we've seen shared, we've seen uh, owned and subscription is incredibly exciting because I think for us, it follows a trend that we've, uh, you know, seen across different industries for the last 10 years. You know, fundamentally, when you look at IoT and the value that it brings to any organization, whether it's an industrial or micro mobility in this instance, it's a shift from selling just a product to selling, selling a service. And I think there's some very subtle differences that occur and we're seeing those play out now with, with teams like, uh, like Dries and Carrion, um, where uh, the uh, product feedback loop is a lot tighter. The offering to the end customer is a lot cleaner when you talk about insurance. The, the friction and adoption to barrier, uh, barriers to adoption are just less. And I think that's all very exciting. And I think it speaks to uh, the growth that we're seeing in the segment. And uh, a lot of it, you know, it is, um, you know, basically just how do you take those technologies and, and deliver something that's net new to a customer segment and, and create more demand. So, um, yeah, very happy to be here uh, and looking forward to, to spending the next hour on packaging all of this. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Um, we spoke a little bit about the, 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 the business and we'll definitely dig deeper into unit economics perspectives and comparison to retailing and so on. But I believe anything in our business starts with the product. The product is a service based on a hardware. Who else than a designer? Bob, what does it mean to design a suitable bike, cargo bike, e-bike, vehicle in general for services like subscription? What have you done in the past, uh, maybe in the segment, if you might disclose from your, from your clients? And if you could, put three, four, five bullet points, what is important, what to design for, because then it might be a nice, a nice uh, chat uh, with uh, two big providers, how they see that. And I know Karyana has some plans in that space as well. I started um, designing bikes uh, out of my racing competition uh, hobby. And then it was a challenge to make them look as light and stiff as possible. So, can you mention that? Yeah, the, the, the connection is, is, is not ideal. Um, let, me, let me try this thing. Wonderful. No worries. In the meantime, yeah. Uh, design of the, of the vehicle. Uh, I hope I didn't dis disclose too much. Bob, can you, can, you, can you hear us already? Is that working? No worries. Then take your time. I, I suppose take your time. We'll come back to that question in a, in a minute, and uh, let's shift back then to to economics. At the end of the day, uh, money talks. So, can you give our guests tonight your view? What are the advantages of subscription comp uh, from the business perspective? We, you hinted very nicely. What are the customer? Uh, benefits, lowering the friction and so on. But speaking uh, of, of uh, business plans and business models, what uh, do you see uh, as your long-term sustainable competitive advantage? Tris, would you like to roll first? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that the, the main advantages of such a model, number one is uh, predictability of the revenue. We are on a recurring revenue basis. And that means that you're able to predict uh, how much you you're making in revenue uh, the next month and, and, and better plan for your supply. Uh, one of the biggest pain points in shared mobility is that we're not, you're unable to predict revenue the next day because there's so many external factors that come and affect the business, the weather, the competition, uh, regulation. So there's so many things that come into play that makes it extremely hard to predict the revenue. So then number one for me is being a recurring revenue business is predictable and it's, it's safe. Number two is all the upselling and cross-selling opportunities that you have in this business. Um, the more you personalize the bike, the more you accessorize the bike, uh, the more your average revenue per, per user increases, right? So for instance, uh, at Moto, what we offer is we have a, basis, a base price of 65 euros with commitment of one year or 75 euros 
fully flexible monthly uh, pricing. But then if you want to eat, add some add-ons, just like a basket, a child seat, uh, you, can, you can pay extra. And that really helps uh, increasing the average basket per, per user. Uh, so that's on the top line, uh, and I think the potential to grow is really in uh, obviously launching new cities and increasing your fleet size, but also upselling and cross-selling. If you look at the cost structure, um, it is a very interesting model, uh, and it's also a, it has the potential to be highly profitable. Uh, today at Moto, for instance, for every subscription that we sell, uh, we have a 50% gross margin, uh, so we are already gross margin positive. The reason why we present margin positive, if you look at your direct costs, you have two types of costs, which is basically your repair costs, and then like the direct costs, just like insurance and, and data. We the, 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 because we design our own bikes and we operate our own fleet, we become highly effective in repairing our own bikes. And there are really like productivity gains when you, when you maintain your own fleet. So that's number one. Number two, we're talking about the personal e-bike. When you subscribe to, uh, to your own bike, it's your bike, so you depend on it on a daily basis to go to work. So you treat it like it's your own. And that makes a big, big uh, difference uh, in terms of uh, repair rate and in terms of uh, the way you, you, you treat the bike as a, as a user. Uh, so I still, if I compare it to shared mobility, uh, I think our, our repair costs are four to five times lower uh, versus any other shared mobility operator. Mm. Mm. The other that, that makes is, that makes a huge huge difference, of course. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, and the other aspect is we don't have to charge the vehicles. Uh, the vehicles are being charged by the user uh, because they can remove the battery and charge it at home. Uh, so that's also kind of a big operational cost that we remove when we operate the service. So um, just in a, to, to sum it up, uh, we see a very stable top line uh, and predictable. Uh, with potential to upsell and cross-sell and increase the average revenue per user. And at the same time, uh, we're able to control and maintain the cost, the operational cost at a really low level because people take good care of their own bike. Mm. Awesome. Is that also your experience in Oslo with, with we, Karianne? Yeah, I would just have to say plus one to everything Drift says. It's the, I mean, we have a almost over 98% of time for our fleet because we don't have to go out and the customers come to us for maintenance and uh, and service instead of we have to go around chasing the vehicles so it's um it's compared to, we have a couple of uh, key roles in our team that also come from sharing both hardware design of shared fleet and operations and they're just blown away by the mm. by the efficiency so uh, and we also even when we have uh, we're in the very beginning and we have very little economy of scale so far we still have great unique economics so this mm. is um this is a very and i mean also compared to strategy wise compared to how some fleet operators and sharing operators have been using like land grabbing and blitz scaling to to sort of gain a threshold in the market this is also something that makes sense even if you don't like blitz scale it can grow in a sort of a, a reasonable, uh, sustainable pattern. And, and that's kind of a healthy thing, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, both of you mentioned it several times, like the vehicle is really the, uh, the essence uh, where you're building your service on. So Bob, can you uh, uh, give us a chance and look behind the scene uh, yeah, regarding so. designing vehicles, vehicles for for services like uh, like uh, we or Moto, I hope so. Let me know if the audio is still uh, of better quality. So, for us as designers, it's a total different challenge to design a product that is optimized for the total cost of ownership. It's very exciting to do because suddenly the um, there is an incentive by the bicycle manufacturers, by the bicycle brands and mobility brands to create a product that is doable, to create a product that can stay on the market for a long time, that can stay up to date for a long time, where you can easily swap all kinds of components to keep the product on the market, to keep the uptime highest possible, mm -hmm. and um, there it create a very sustainable product a lot of people are forgetting that uh, a subscription model is very sustainable because the uptime 
is very high compared with a normal consumer product. And of course, we have designed a lot of consumer products for a normal linear business model. And it's also great to do. But the challenges of a subscription-based product are different. And since the loop is closed, since the mobility provider is staying, is staying the owner of the product, the loop is closed and they can also refurbish and uh, recycle the, the product all the, uh, all the time to keep it on the road. And that makes it for us very interesting. How much can you influence of, of really the, the, the future, uh, the future PNL uh, of uh, subscription providers? How much can you really influence on your start, not the end, but on, on your end, so to say, on your point of industrial design? Um, yeah. Can you really, so can you really, I, I, have, do I you can have give a you an example. Here? Yeah, I can give you an example. So we do the e-bike development of Swapfeeds. Swapfeeds is a well-known uh, business model, well-known company. And over the last six years, they gathered a lot of data about um, the maintenance costs, about what kind of components fail, what kind of components don't fail. And we use all that data to develop a product, develop a new e-bike that will be on the market, I think, in half a year. Um, that reduces the total cost of ownership a lot, but also creates a product that is extremely durable. So as we all know, the industry has a lot of problems with supply chain issues at the moment. And what we did for Swapfees is that we designed a motor bracket, for example, and in that motor bracket, you can fit three types of motors. Yes. So even when Swapfees chooses to um, buy an un use another type of motor over the years, in, in three years, for example, they can still use the same frame. And we do the same with the battery. So the battery uh, BMS can talk with three types of motors. And therefore, you can also use that, that battery for all kinds of bicycles in the fleet. And that makes it very interesting. These kind of challenges you normally don't see in a consumer product. <laughs> awesome. You mentioned uh that uh, you will be lowering uh, uh, the, the total uh, costs by, by a margin. Can you be specific a little bit? Uh, your first estimation from your test runs. Uh, will you get it single digit, double digit uh, lower? Oh, I hope double digit. I All hope right. so. Yeah, I hope All so. Right. I, I can uh, see Driss and Karian listening carefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's um, good to hear. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's looking forward. If you look back, when Swapfit started, they needed to maintain the bicycles at least three times a year. And over the years, they improved their bicycles so much that now they only need to go there once a year. And that's a huge improvement. And they started with normal consumer bikes. And over the yeah. years, they improved, they improved. And hopefully, yeah. the next model will be the best. Yeah, awesome, Bob. Thank you for, for, for that. Sure. Speaking of uh, starting with consumer e-bikes and moving towards uh, really own development and custom, how about uh, on your side, Driss? You started in May with your uh, e-bikes, so version one on the market. Can you give us and our listeners tonight a little bit of insight of the first months on the market from the product and design perspective? Sure. Uh, so we first started in 2021 with the off-the-shelf bike that we bought from a provider and we basically launched a fleet of 100 plus bikes just to test the service and really focus on what does subscription means in terms of user experience and in terms of repairs, in terms of the whole experience for, for, uh, for both the users and the company. And then when we collected some data, we started working on our own design. So we actually have a, a designer in-house uh, who's worked on on uh, on developing and and uh, industrializing a motorbike, which is a fully proprietary bike, and uh, and and I think that one of the the big insights from from the experience is uh, don't underestimate uh, kind of the reality check uh, from like that you get from launching the bike and having actual people using the bike because you can design and you can prototype as much as you want. Uh, the reality is that 
you'll only have good insights when you see people actually actually interacting with the bike. And we've learned so much over the past six months uh, from our users. We learned we learned from like the the mechan the teams of mechanics that we have in house, uh, and we're already iterating on the bike, and we are releasing the second version of the bike early next year, which is basically uh, an improvement of what we have. We're not changing completely the 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 model. We're just improving the model on certain points that we have learned from from our experience. Um, so everything's done in house. Uh, the things that we don't know to do, we don't know how to do, which is basically the whole electronical and, and electric part. We outsource. We work with third party partners. We're not engineers. We're not bike manufacturers. We're bike design designers and operators. Uh, the things that we're not able to uh, to manage, we outsource, and we we have amazing partners that are working with us on on this. And as we move forward with the business, as we keep learning, we want to internalize gradually uh, some of the parts. But the idea is really to focus on our DNA, which is operations and crafting beautiful products for our, for our users. Mm, mm, mm. How is your journey? Thank you very much, Trish. How is your journey, Karianne, with, with your VI? I know you started with, uh, with of course, off-the-shelf bicycles, so to say. But uh, maybe that, that's not the final stage. Uh, no, not at all. It's kind of the same as this, uh, this is concept. Um, I've been very much into different kinds of cargo bikes for a long time. And uh, we started out with uh, a total of four different high end uh, compact mid tail cargo bikes with a bike for three with uh, space for two to three passengers. Um, and what we very soon saw was that especially the operations um, are essential and to sort of make the, the um, for us, the bike that's most favorably perceived by the users is also the most cumbersome to maintain uh, in the uh. workshops. So it's all about uh, sort of viewing the end user as well as the mechanics as important users in the design. Um, we are also looking at, since for this sort of niche of bikes, the accessories are almost more important than the bike itself, because that's what takes it from a bike to a station wagon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so we're really looking at the, the bike as a system and having modular accessories that will, some are lockable and some are easily removable and just letting the bike grow with the user on a lifetime um, through a lifespan is something that's really important to us and also adding um, focus on some not very sexy but super important usability factors and accessibility factors which is the um, uh, step through frame the sort of the width of the step through and how you really focus on the kickstand because it's so important and also um, like small things that um, Bob obviously has uh, been thinking about stuff like uh, not making it feel like it shackles and all of these like quality measurements that you mm -hmm. that's kind of not tangible but really just improves the overall experience of the bike. Mm. How do you collect the yeah, feedback so from, from your customers? Uh, we do uh, running surveys, we do user interviews, and we also have a, a forum group, uh, and we do uh, uh, observations as well. So we try to stay very, very close to our community and sort of work on building the, the community. And that also gives a ripple effect in marketing because they will always recommend that to their friends. And uh, we also see that the early adopters of our service becomes very strong ambassadors for us. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, awesome. We have a few more questions to go through before we come over to question from our audience. So I just wanna use this opportunity to invite everyone who joined us tonight, use Q&A um, in your Zoom, uh, put your questions in, we'll get to that uh, within a few minutes. So please use the opportunity. Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer that as many questions from your end as, as possible. But before we get to our audience questions, let me let me ask um, one more regarding the comparison of, let's say, two uh, representatives of subscription services. You, Karianne, providing cargo bike mainly family focused. Motto is more widely uh, widely focused in, in in Paris. 
But still, how did you land on this plan? Why are you here tonight, basically? Karianne, would you start? Yeah, or Dries, oh, yeah, choice, choice is yours, yes. Um, so for us, uh, I think we saw the opportunity in the e-bike market, uh, which is growing really, really fast. Uh, and I've always wanted to work in the industry and to do something around the product. And before starting on, on this on this journey, I've I got the chance to talk with a lot of users of e-bikes, so people who own an e-bike or use shared e-bikes, or people who are thinking about e-bikes but were not able to or have not um, taken the step to use them. So I tried to go through like what are the barriers to entry, what are like the barriers to adoption, and all the answers were always the same: uh, theft, maintenance, price, uh, and and. Uh, and in parallel to this, I've seen the hardware as a service industry uh, um, really like uh, going, progressing super fast. Uh, and, and I really think we're living a Netflix moment in, in mobility just like uh, we, we did in, with music and, and, uh, and, uh, and films a few years ago. And, uh, and it was just obvious for me that the best way to address this market is, is subscription. Um, I think, retail, I think um, retail is suboptimal. Uh, I think that shared mobility is a partial answer. Uh, but not a complete one. And I think the best of both worlds is really subscription. That's how I came to, uh, to start this project. Wonderful, yeah. How about you, Karianne, designer? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's a combination of having my own life transformed by a cargo bike with three kids living in the city. Uh, and the other thing, because it, it's kind of, it's impossible to explain. You have to experience it. And that's, a lot of people see these bikes and they see a, an expensive and very strange bike, but it's just a, a really, it's just a transformational tool, really. Yeah. So I, I was doing some UX research work for uh, the Oslo PTA, Rutir, which is kind of a progressive PTA. Um, and they, I was working with a combined mobility project. Uh, and we were having a couple of hundred users on a, uh, like a mass app type of thing where you could share and everything. And we did like really massive user insight work with them. And I just waited for someone to do that. I just, I, I was like really, mm. uh, and also the, um, the Norwegian Institute of Transport Research has been doing quite a big study on car sharing, which has also been kind of a thing I've been into for a long time. So combine these two things. And one of the like main findings um, a researcher said was that both um, becoming a parent is a tipping point into a car-based lifestyle, and also that car sharers will often give out uh, an e-bike or a cargo bike as a um, solution or something that enables them to use car sharing and for car sharing to be good enough. So the symbiosis mm. of car sharing and e-bikes or cargo bikes is a good enough transportation solution even in car centric communities and cities and that was like really what made the light bulb go up for me hmm. imagine how many how many uh, communities and cities like you described right now out of out of dependence still are there uh, around the globe so this is uh, one of one of the fine solutions nate can uh, particle be of a help uh, in growing the um, uh, micro mobility subscription segment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to think so, right? We we come from uh, this um, ethos of basically taking these product companies and turning them into a service company. And I think, you know, hearing the stories that Dries and Karian are sharing, um, it, it resonates a lot because what we designed our products and platform to do are basically be incredibly flexible and customizable. And you hear the uniqueness of the customer group that, that Dries is sharing. And you have to split that not only into the internal users who are repairing the bikes and building the bikes, as well as the riders who are, are taking these and putting them through their paces in Paris. And how do you um, basically create models to understand the points at which you should be servicing the bike, as well as the digital experiences that your, your customers are having. And this is true for, you know, both, uh, you know, we and, uh, and Moto. But, you know, I think also, you know, beyond sort of that more concrete level of, 
okay, we can, we can do all of that analysis. We can fit into different bike frames. We can talk to different BMSs. We can talk to different motor controllers. That's all the sort of like blocking and tackling of IoT um, that you know, teams can control their destiny on with Particle. I think the other thing that, that shifts, um, which is a little bit more subtle, is the relationship that these teams now have with their customers. Um, if you think about this when uh, you, know, you come from the B2C world, you're gonna sell a bike, you're gonna sell a product. And very often you don't know the next touch point you'll have with that customer. You don't know when they may want to purchase a new bike or look to cross sell or upsell on something else. Or if you come from you know, shared mobility, um, you, you have these assets, you're gonna go through a design cycle on maybe an annual cadence, but what do you do with your old fleet? You know, at what point do you deprecate it? And what are the channels to do so? These become murky questions. And I think what's exciting about subscription is that a lot of those problems are solved. You have this ongoing relationship with your user base, uh, you know, like Carrie Ann was talking about, we've got a community. These people are uh, net promoters. They are very bought into the product. They're going to want the next generation of the bike, or maybe they have such a relationship with a the vehicle. They'll want to purchase that after a certain period of time. And that helps the teams to finance their next uh, iteration and use all of that data that they gathered in uh, those vehicles operating at that point in time to inform the design decisions, to inform the, the next level of experiences. So I think we play a role there. And certainly when you talk about you know, total cost of ownership, um, that all plays into how well you can be uh, efficient in your operations, how well can you scale uh, your teams to new cities, to new markets, uh, create standard operating procedures, uh, as well as deliver end experiences that uh, are coming at a reduced cost. We're, we're pretty excited in the next couple of months, we'll be announcing some partnerships with uh, insurance providers that, you know, because our technology inherently tracks these vehicles, because it helps in the um, collection or sort of, uh, you know, the, the story of what happens after it gets stolen, how do we get those back? Um, they're confident enough to offer exclusive rates to members. Uh, and, you know, beyond that, in, in a couple of years time, we'll be doing utilization-based insurance, taking all of that data uh, and piping that through to the insurance providers to have different rates based on you know, different profiles of, of ridership and, and things like that. So I would say Particle and, and IoT definitely have a, a very core role. It's a little bit behind the scenes, but um, you know, it helps to, uh, helps to support teams like uh, Kerian and, and Dries, uh, and, and it's very exciting to be in the space. Mm, that sounds uh, really promising uh, insurance. Definitely with all the theft uh, fears of the customers that are joining the, the scene, uh, this is uh, really a bundling of IoT technology with, with, uh, with uh, insurance. That will be a milestone again. Uh, so interesting. Uh, keep us uh, and the community up to date, please, Nate. Yeah. Uh, before we jump over to uh, our listeners' questions, two really quick, short uh, questions to, to our guests here. First, the major challenge of your last six months, really short fire, fire chat, Karianne, the major uh, challenge uh, of you and your team in the last six months. Oh, that has been fundraising for us um, and asset financing. Asset financing is like a hellhole that we never <laughs> seem to be good get over. As a fairly new company with asset heavy uh, and and also assets that aren't really um, loanable. Uh, we really were des desperately looking for a financial product. And that's something that like governments and regulatory measures should enforce because this is so important. And uh, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a struggle, really, asset financing. Please mm, help Fingers <laughs> crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, well, yeah, maybe someone's um, listening yeah. tonight. Driss, how about you? Six months, uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, quick answer, supply chain. Easily, supply number chain. one challenge. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Bob, for you? Yeah, I'm uh, in a different position. For us, it was mainly choosing the right clients to work with. The All industry right. is booming in all directions and many parties are trying to start up something or trying to evolve in the industry. Uh -huh. So for us, it's filtering the right partners and the right clients. Interesting. Curation as a, as, a, as a skill. Wonderful. Nate, for you, Particle, what was the challenge? Yeah, I think similar to Dries, we saw uh, both you know, supply chain on the bike side as well as on the silicon side. Um, our team uh, has done some heroic work to really insulate our business. We redesigned all of our hardware 
so that moving forward, everything is supply secure. We can guarantee it in unrestricted quantities. And we've done a, work, a lot of work to make sure it's modular to uh, speak with different systems, uh, whether you're using CAN bus or UART on, on the controller side. So uh, it, it was uh, not fun to do, but uh, we're in a better position for it. So uh, it was a good exercise. Good to hear. Last, before we jump to listeners' questions, how do you plan and think about scaling from one city like Oslo to many cities, from one city uh, like Paris to other countries? What's the plan? What's your playbook? I can go first here. Um, we have been doing some experiments in other Norwegian cities just to um, doing some analysis. Uh, and what we're seeing is that um, this, we don't really want to go into a mar market that has to be subsidized. So we will, uh, we prefer to go into, so my guess is that Oslo is the smallest city we will be in and that we will rather go internationally as soon as possible. So that's our, our strategy for next year, really. Wonderful. Brace uh, Europe, brace yourself for we. Coinc it can coexist. <laughs> Driss? Yeah, so for us, expansion is... Um... So we, we're going to be focusing on three three type of cities. Uh, good cycling infrastructure, that's the number one uh, requirement. Uh, number two is um, large enough market where we can scale our business. And number three is uh, purchasing power. Uh, so making sure that we have those three aspects to make sure that we can scale uh, in the most efficient way. And the playbook is pretty simple. Uh, we want to partner with local, local companies to operate the fleet with us. Uh, we don't want to go fully internal and fully in-house in all the markets to address. We want to rely on local knowledge. We want to re rely on local expertise uh, when it comes to operations. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Bob, would you uh, like to add something or shall we go to our listeners' questions? Let's go to the questions. All right. We got uh, for the moment, yeah, a lot, a lot. Uh, thank you very much for the audience. As usually with micromobility industries, we have the best audience and I'm so glad uh, to uh, go through all the questions. One promise, what we, don't be, what we won't be able to answer tonight live uh, on the webinar, we'll get back to that uh, in, uh, in a message afterwards. So I'll, I'll try to choose as uh, smoothly. How far is the subscription model geographically restricted to dense cities? We touched upon a little bit. Uh, that's a question by Alex Murray. Uh, anything to add that's not been said so far, especially regarding the uh, repair and maintenance, if, for example, customer lives in the rural area? Um, I would like to answer that. Uh, to us, it's not really um, in terms of the customer living rurally or ability to maintain it because it's so infrequent. So that's not a big deal. But the, the big deal is how convenient the car is. So it, it's, it's more about being a better option because people uh, choose e-bikes not from, they choose it out of practicality, not for, uh, not that much out of sort of um, environmental uh, concerns, but they choose e electrical cars out of environmental concerns, paradox. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's the convenience of the car that always is, Sort of the measurable and whenever the car uh, becomes uh, w whenever there's too much traffic or too much congestion the the e-bike always wins mm -hmm. good good um anything to address before we jump to another other question uh no just on that point for us uh our area of focus is really the areas that we're able to service so we need to be able to uh provide the same quality of service to everyone. Um, so but uh, basically, the zero fence, uh, for instance, in Paris, right now we, we uh, serve Paris, inner city, and, um, and the first ring around Paris. And as we extend our, our, our network of operations and mechanics, we'll be able to serve more people. But the, the, let's say the priority for us is to provide the same quality of service to everyone. Understand. Wonderful. OK. We got a question from uh, Arpas Jamel. Uh, that's uh, what mechanism do you have in place for customers that keep uh, missing payments constantly? So basically, um, do you have a trouble with uh, with uh, 
collecting the payments as according to subscription. I can start with this because uh, we, we face the situation. Uh, so obviously the, the first uh, mechanism is to try to reach out to the person and, uh, and see uh, if they can. Most of the time it's people who don't update their credit card numbers on the, on the, <laughs> on the app. So they, they, they can't be charged. Uh, so what we do is we reach out to the, to the, to the user, to the member and uh, ask them to update the, the credit card number. In case that's a voluntary thing, meaning they don't want to pay um, thanks to IoT modules, just like Particle is providing, we're able to uh, uh, kind of deactivate uh, the bike remotely. Uh, so the electrical park, part of the bike doesn't work anymore. You're not able to, uh, uh, to ride the bike um, anymore. And we're able to go and recover the bike because the bike is tracked uh, with a GPS, uh, GPS in car. Okay. Was, the, was it uh, any, any really serious trouble for you in the, in the, in the last months, uh, speaking of numbers, percentage? No, that's uh, the, mar the, the share of people who voluntarily stop paying is very marginal. Most of the time, it's just people who forget to update their credit card numbers. Yeah, that's, that's a funny point. Yes, we all forget. Karianne, any experience up in the north? Um, I mean, we, we have some customers that are struggling with payment, and it might be related to the cost of living crisis and increased interest and all of that. So we're just following up. And uh, in like one or two cases, we've had to go and uh, collect the bike. And uh, that's devastating to people. So they will stretch as far as they can to actually just get ahead and pay the bills. Mm, okay, so the, the bike really became part of their life. We have a, a 90, when, when asked in a survey, 96.6 .6 of our customers clay, say that it's their main mode of transportation. Mm, that's wonderful. I can imagine many in the mobility space would love to have that number. Uh, okay, speaking of, of, uh, of uh, numbers, um, how, do, how long does it take to pay off the purchase price of the, uh, of the bike? So basically, what, how do you run your business model planning? I can, I can take this one. Uh, right now, uh, obviously, we are still improving and lowering the purchase cost of the bike. Uh, as we scale, we'll, we'll get to economies of scale and we'll be able to negotiate better prices with components uh, and also like a, a lower cost when it comes to transportation. We know that transportation and container were ex extremely expensive until very recently and the prices are going are starting to go down. Uh, so our rentability or profitability levels are improving. So we're able to pay back the, the, the bike faster. But today, uh, we estimate that we can pay back the bike around 10 months after, after uh, purchasing the bike, 10 months of subscription. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Driss. Karianne? Uh, I think we've been uh, flexing a little bit and experimenting with different models, depending on how you calculate it, if it, since we're operating with vendor bikes. Uh, but we are, I think it is 24 months. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, so our first customers are nearing their down payment time at okay. as we speak, but then we also have upsells on accessories and uh, other services. Bob, was it was this uh, part of any briefing from uh, any of your clients in the subscription space? Basically, making the calculation, uh, designing the bike, uh, total target yeah. price compared to uh, what the market is available to. Uh, to, to pay in a subscription. Yeah, of course. Um, the problem list is very important and the target price is less important than uh, compared with the consumer bike. But there's another interesting trend that I see, uh, which is worth mentioning, that more and more suppliers of bicycle components are offering the same. So they're offering a subscri subscription model for the motor or for the tires or for whatever. And that reduces the upfront cost for Karianne and Driss as well. In my I know opinion, it's very interesting. I know Swap Feeds uh, have a, as a business uh, a subscription deal with uh, with tire uh, provider uh, Victoria. Victoria. Yeah, Victoria. Uh, but maybe maybe others are coming to the space. Interesting, interesting. So if anyone listening. Uh, Considering oh, yeah. to jump into the space, then uh, this is this is a road uh, to 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 follow definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and again, 
to emphasize on durability and sustainability, suddenly these uh, component suppliers have an incentive to create a very good and long lasting product. And they do. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. As you, as you said, uh, Bob, so, uh, I'll, I'll stay with you, Bob, uh, because and then we'll make the round. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, JD Aguilar. How do you see loss prevention playing a role in the future of subscription model? I'll, I'll modify that a little bit. What can you as industrial designers do to really play into favor from the design on of the vehicles, not only the service, uh, to, to prevent the, the, the theft and, and loss of, of the vehicles? I mean, will we stay with air techs uh, by Apple only, or is there more in the pipelines? Mm. I, I think uh, that's more uh, Nate's profession, IoT based. Um, in terms of product design, I think we should rely on IoT related solutions for the future to protect loose, loss, or theft of bicycles. Fair point. Nate, would you like to jump in and add, add anything? Yeah, a little bit of color. You know, I, I think it's fun to work with, um, you know, uh, that challenge in mind and, and work backwards with all of the other considerations on the table. And that's where, you know, our team will find ourselves interfacing with, uh, you know, folks like Bob uh, at, at the at the drawing table. You know, what is the industrial design that we're trying to achieve? Who is the co target customer? And, and what is uh, what are we, you know, working from from a de design principle standpoint? And then a lot of, you know, our approach is not to be a, a retrofit solution where you sort of you know, tack it onto a bike somewhere. I think that um, the thieves are, are just more sophisticated these days and a lot of them know, you know where to look and, and what to do. And so we find ourselves uh, very early in that design cycle, um, thinking about where will our electronics live inside this vehicle? It'll be a native integration. And there are some considerations you have to take into account on antenna placement. Uh, but you know, once that's done, and once we're basically inside the frame of the vehicle, um, we are able to then interface with all of the systems. So you talk about um, prevention, you know, we, we wanna make sure that we can uh, do scenarios like uh, alarms when the vehicle is not uh, meant to be moved and uh, you know, alert people in the area, alert the user that something is happening. Uh, we also wanna be able to take preventative measures in that scenario. Well, hey, something's gone wrong, let's disable the motor. Let's make it very challenging for a thief to actually access and uh, you know, gain utility from this vehicle. And in the worst case scenarios, you know, something is stolen. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's make sure that our electronics sleep and, and basically operate on a very low battery consumption level. So we have 30 days or 60 days for teams to go out and retrieve these vehicles and get them back to the rightful owners. Um, all while knowing that, you know, at the end of the day, this this um, offering is protected by insurance. So, um, you know, there's a lot that we're working on both sides of, of the spectrum on. And I think it's a fun, you know, design challenge to basically think about it from the front. You know, how do we make sure that we're natively inside this vehicle and, and we're protecting it in as secure a way as possible? Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for for updating all of us. Um, got a question from uh, from our co-player in this in the space. It's Ton Damen. Uh, from Cargoro, uh, Chef Cargo e-bikes in more than 10 cities uh, in the, started in the, in the Netherlands. Um, the question is, uh, what's your take on insights with uh, scaling with more than double, doubling the fleet? So how can you really go fast uh, in scaling, in scaling the, the fleets to get people out of cars? Because their statement is no car, no problem. Driss, maybe, I mean, you, you already touched upon a little bit uh, in, in Paris yeah. uh, with the support of what uh, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor and the team are doing, but still, how do yeah, you balance? So, so the question is how, how fast can we scale the fleet, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, hopefully as, as fast as, we, as, as possible. Uh, that's our goal is to, is to put the next uh, million of people on, on e-bikes through the subscription model. I think mm. uh, the best way to approach it is to provide, to really focus on the service, uh, to consider that this business is first operation focus and it's a service more than just a product. Uh, so it all, it all starts with the service. And um, if you make it the service as seamless as possible, and if you keep uh, your pricing low enough to make sure that you attract a maximum number of people, uh, then, then there's no reason for, 
for more and more people to drop their cars and, and shift to, uh, to, uh, to this type of mobility. Just one point here, I, I think that we see some of, of the users that come to Moto and they tell us, I used to, to uh, drive my car every day to go to work, uh, but I, I switched to, uh, to Moto to subscription, but it doesn't mean that they sold their car. Most of the time people keep their car and they use it on the weekends uh, to travel outside of Paris and then they will use on a daily basis uh, the, the bike to, to go to work and, and run errands. So I don't think that the absolute enemy is car. I think that the two are complementary. I think that the two can coexist. Uh, we see it with people who have a car, they keep it and they use it on weekends, they use it to go on holidays. And when it comes to their daily life, they would use a bike, which is still a good way to, to lower the, the carbon emission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tris. Um, got another question, Ivan Mikovic. Uh, that's uh, Andres again, uh, mentioning the, the lower uh, uh, maintenance costs compared to shared mo mobility that you have experienced with. But can you share a little bit more what the highest costs in the subscription model you're running are? And uh, how can you uh, improve these points in the future? So to optimize your uh, maintenance costs. And same then, uh, Karyan, if you then want to add. So how can you really, what are the areas uh, lowering uh, further your maintenance costs? Yeah, I think for uh, when it comes to maintenance, the number one improvement area is, is designing the hardware. That's what Bob was saying before. Is like, uh, if you want to lower the cost of ownership of your of your bike and the, and the maintenance costs, you need to design with repair, repairability in mind. So that's number one, just design as mm. vehicle as sturdy as possible. Um, so that's kind of on the maintenance side of things. And, and to answer the first part of the question, which, which is the other big cause that we have is, is the cost of acquisition of, of clients. Uh, uh -huh. We're still a consumer-based uh, service. We need to acquire users. We need to run marketing campaigns. Um, but on that point, we also see like pretty low tax and, and customer acquisition cost uh, because you really have a network effects that works pretty well in this area where the more bikes you have on the streets, the more users you have, the more organic traffic you have to your service people because people talk about it. There's a word of mouth um, kind of circle that works pretty well and people come to you naturally. And, and we see that about half of the people who subscribe to Moto are people that have heard about the service through a friend, through a colleague who have seen the bike on the, on the streets. Mm. Hmm. Would you like to add anything, Ariana? Thank you, Tris. Yeah, your your main yeah, we, maintenance costs. Yeah, uh, we uh, as Tris said also we have also uh, around fifty percent referral or some heard from it from someone they know. Um, our main operation cost is um, is labor, and that's a good thing. We we want to be a responsible actor and offer. Uh, solid contracts and, and regulated pay. So we want to be a, a long-term good employer for our workers. Uh, so it's all about sort of improving the cost of uh, the economy of scale and uh, building better products and, and also um, getting a more efficient supply chain for us mm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, your colleague Anders is working on design of uh all all in house uh, new cargo bike is that true can you can you give us a little few hints i can confirm and I'm, we've also been talking to bob uh, about <laughs> this on eurobike this summer but we've released a very rough concept and we will continue working with that um, oh, the next awesome. couple of months yeah awesome 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 i can and see also, i can of see course. Yeah, sorry go ahead yeah and also i mean we were repairability longevity and sort of just moving away from planned obsolescence and uh, the sort of disposability that the bike industry is also desperate, kind of riddled with is something that we really aim to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, Karina. I can see Luke joining us back, but before I hand over, so uh, I have one uh, a quick question around the table here. Can you share with our listeners a sort of a, a wrap up? One, maybe a little bit emotional moment from running your current company's motto, uh, we grow design and, and particle that uh, sticks with you and gives you the energy every morning. Like, yes, that makes sense. It might be from a customer interaction, might be uh, with a competitor interaction, 
But what, what is what is the, that gives you the energy to go through? It's not easy every day. We all know in the micromobility space. But still, what is your fire? Karianne, would you would you mind starting? Um, I just really want to just change cities. I just want to reclaim the streets, and this is the tool to sort of the only way we can get to the 15 minute city in a sustainable way. So that's my goal. Thank you. Tak. Chris, how about you? Um, I think for me, it's, uh, we're lucky to have a, a location in central Paris where we have users uh, coming like regularly to repair the bike or for onboardings. And, and I get to spend a lot of time talking to users and the, the sentence that, that comes the most, that comes back the most is, uh, uh, you changed my life uh, because people are coming from public transportation, they're coming from like cars, they're coming from mo motorcycles and they wanted to change the way they commute every day. And, and uh, that's really what uh, keeps me going every day. Awesome, thank you. Bob, for you? Yeah, for me, it's an interesting question. For me, it's very clear, it's the team. It's, I've had this hobby and interest for a very long time and it became my profession. But now I have a whole team of people being just as passionate about the work as I am. And that's very motivating. Mm. Awesome, congrats and thank you. Nate, how about you, Particle? Yeah, to round us off, you know, I, I got in this space because I've ridden an electric scooter as a primary form of transit since like 2015. And so I, I think I was very deep into the community and that resonated with me. So being able to take our technology and, and bring it to the community and also interface with it, that's that's really recharging. We do these last mile leadership dinners uh, in conjunction with major conferences and once a quarter and getting, you know, folks like Bob and Karian and uh, VCs and policymakers all in the same room and seeing the energy that comes out and the projects that stem from it. I mean, it's exhilarating. I think that is uh, a lot of what keeps me going, just that type of interaction with the community. Mm, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Luke, would you, want, would, you, would you like to add? I mean, I don't bring people together like this. And I think this was a great conversation. I, I, the, feedback from the audience here i don't think we've ever had this many questions so i apologize to anybody who didn't get to i know roman was moving very briskly through as many as he could uh, I, 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 I tried sorry uh, I, I, my apologies as well to, to to our listeners we'll do our best to to come back to you then no it's exciting it's exciting to see this much uh, clearly we're onto something here and there's a lot of interest in the subscription and you're all on something by building companies in the space so you know hats off to you guys um if people want to continue to ask you questions or just follow you and get, learn more, what would be the best way to do that? Maybe we'll just go around really quickly. Um, Bob, let's start with you. Sorry, I missed your question. What would be the best way for people to follow you or find out more about what you do? Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, LinkedIn works out. Yeah, you can Great. add me and uh, Fook Design as a company. Great. Uh, Kariana? Same for me, LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, Nate? Uh, I'd say shoot me an email. Uh, I live in my inbox. So Nathan at particle.com or Nate at particle.com. Uh, LinkedIn is, a, is, is another option, but email is best. Perfect. Uh, Driss? Yeah, LinkedIn as well is perfect. Or you can shoot me an email at driss at ridemoto.com. Awesome. Roman? Oh, used to be Twitter, but that's, uh, that's a sinking ship. So uh, let's uh, stick with LinkedIn, of course, yes. Easy to find uh, and always responsive. Great, great. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to anyone who didn't get a question answered today. Uh, try to track down some more panelists um, on LinkedIn uh, or email and get them, uh, you know, really get some more answers from them. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for being here and spending time with us and helping us go into your business and being so open and frank and intimate about, you know, what the challenges are and what the, what the opportunities are and all these kind of details. I think it was just a really marvelously sort of uh, in, in depth and detailed conversation. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Roman, for moderating. Um, and let's do it again soon. Uh, I hope to see you all very soon uh, in person or virtually. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. See you Thank in Amsterdam latest. See you guys.